Hi everyone and welcome back to Allied Health 102 Intro to Phlebotomy. <clears throat> and you guys are used to this, we always start with our learning objectives, right? Because whenever we're starting something, we always want to have goals and objectives. We want to know what we should be learning as we're reading the chapter 15 in our textbook, as we're watching this PowerPoint presentation. We want to know at the end of this, what are our objectives for the things that we should learn? So remember, these are vitally important. So make sure you're reading through them just to touch base on what you should know at the end of doing this. And remember, if you read chapter 15 in your textbook, watch the PowerPoint presentations here, have your black binder out and fill out your review guides and then study those review guides, you will do really well. And remember, at the end of chapter 15, we're going to be able to describe all these blood tests that are listed, everything from ABGs down to trace metals. We're going to be able to describe donor room collections and all the things in between. OK, these learning objectives are also listed at the front of your textbook. So let's get started. We're going to start off talking about blood cultures. Now, we talked about blood cultures a lot in lab. Um, we have had talks about them and we have had demonstrations and we've even drawn some blood cultures. OK, so these are all ways that we constantly go over and over in multiple ways from hands on to lecture about something like blood cultures to make sure you guys are getting it from every angle. So you will know all there is to know about the collection of blood cultures. OK. Now, we know that typically the reason doctors order blood cultures is because patients come in with what we call FUO, which is fever of an unknown origin, usually a very high fever, right? So we got to realize that sometimes when there is a bacterial infection in one location of the body, bacteremia or septicemia, which is the presence of bacteria and toxins in the blood, may result, okay? So the most important factor concerning blood cultures is to use aseptic technique when drawing the blood. We have went over that and over that and over that in lab. And I know you guys could have answered that with your eyes shut because I've sat there in lab many times and said to you all, what is the most important factor concerning blood cultures? And everybody says aseptic technique when drawing those blood cultures, right? But remember, bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in the blood. And remember, septicemia is those toxins that build, in the, build up in the blood due to that bacterial infection, right? And this can be very serious and very life-threatening and can bring death to patients, okay? Remember, also when you're drawing your blood cultures, that um, you can give a false positive causing the doctor, right? I've talked to you all about this in lab, to go out there and tell this person's family that they may be at a risk of dying, which causes a lot of unnecessary stress and fear, not to mention, right, if the doctor gets a false positive on that um, blood culture, he may actually start administering medications to this patient that they don't need. And as we're all aware, medications have their place and we're lucky to have them. But we also know that there can be multiple side effects from our medications and even though they may save our lives they can also cause some damage so we never want to give patients medications that they don't need okay so also remember that too much blood collected in those blood culture bottles can cause a false positive and if you don't get enough blood in there you can get a false negative okay and and if you're if they really are positive and because you didn't draw enough blood in the blood culture bottle, then it may not come up as a positive and it may take days longer before we come to realize that there really are septic. And by that time, it really could cause permanent damage to that patient or truly death. So these blood cultures are really, really important. So guys, just remember when you're out there, I know there are a lot of work, all the work it takes to make sure that you're drawing them aseptically right 
and the fact that you have to draw them in one arm and 30 minutes later go back and then do that aseptic technique which is the most important thing in drawing blood cultures all over again and yes i understand it's a lot of work and sometimes you may want to convince yourself that it's not important but it is vitally important so guys please make sure that you be the best professional healthcare worker you can be and make sure you stick to this guidelines of doing this job because it is important. Okay, now let's talk about interfering factors, okay? We understand from our, our flower picture, right, that yellow sun in the sky represents blood cultures, right? Whether you're drawing them in, a, in an appropriate yellow top tube or most likely you're drawing them in a set of blood culture bottles, which you'll see someone in this picture here on the screen collecting blood culture bottles using a wind infusion set and a vacutainer holder, okay? And we always draw the blood cultures first, no matter if they're in the bottles or if they're in the yellow top, right? You do not want to scrape the needle across the skin. This can contaminate the blood cultures, right? The anaerobic vial is collected first, except when you're using a wing infusion set, remember? Because it's without air. And so we don't want to take that air that is in the wing infusion set and put it into the bottle because it will suck that air into there, right? And we're trying to catch bacteria that grows in the absence of air. You draw it first if you're not using a wing infusion set. If you're drawing a wing infusion set, okay, then we want to make sure that we do it opposite of that, right? If the patient is on antibiotics, which a lot of times you will see this, okay? That's why you want to ask them what medications they're on or talk to their nurse to find out if they've already been started on antibiotics. Because if they do, then you should draw your blood cultures in vials that contain resin beads and gently mix to prevent false negative results, okay? Those resin beads are going to inactivate that antibiotic that is in that blood so that the antibiotic doesn't kill the bacteria so the bacteria that is in the person's bloodstream will have a chance to grow so we can culture it, find out what uh, bacteria it is so we will know how to properly and effectively treat our patients, right? If second set of blood cultures are ordered, now it might happen that they're not, but mostly they are, okay? The second collection should be at a different site other than the arm at a different time, okay? We don't want to draw them both in the same place. And we should wait 30 minutes to an hour later before we draw our second set of blood cultures. And we also want to make sure they're labeled properly, letting the lab know which set was first and which set was second. When you're using blood culture bottles for evacuated tubes, do not feel directly from the tube holder needle assembly because of the possibility of reflux. Media flowing backwards into the vein, use a butterfly or syringe. So after collecting the blood, remove the iodine from the skin with alcohol. We talked about this in the lab, right? So if you're going to use this evacuated tube system that you see right up here on the screen and we've used in the lab, you don't want to use a regular evacuated needle. And the reason would be is because you would have, y'all know how I teach you to land your hand on their forearm to stabilize the hand, your dominant hand, while the needle is in the vein. If you have it like that, then you're going to have to pick that blood culture bottle up and push it onto the vacutainer holder, right? Imagine when we're in lab drawing regular, uh, regular vacutainer systems for just regular tubes, like that SST tube you see there in the picture. If we're just using that multi-stick needle, then that bottle would be turned in a way where the media that's inside that bottle would flow forward and it would be against that inner needle and there is always a possibility that that media could be sucked into our patient's vein. So we never, ever, ever want to use that multi-stick needle attached to the holder you see in the picture to collect our blood cultures. We either want to draw it in a syringe and then properly with a transfer device, 
transfer it from the syringe into the blood culture bottles and then any other tubes that we have ordered or attach a uh, winged infusion set or butterfly which is what you see in this picture to your vacutainer holder and draw it like, exactly like you see in this picture but never do it the other way okay and we remember we did this in lab right you have to scrub that area for one full minute watching your watch with that alcohol acetone scrub pad right then you apply your iodine if that is what they use at your particular facility you let that dry and then once it does if you're drawing any other test you want to make sure that using alcohol you try to get as much of that iodine off the patient's skin as humanly possible because we know it is an interfering substance okay you want to always in anything follow the manufacturer's directions when prepping the patient's arm for blood culture you want to always fill the anaerobic bottle first except when we talked about right if you're using a butterfly Unless there is not enough blood for both bottles, then put all the blood in the aerobic bottle, okay? You guys really need to get this stuff down because you're going to come in to multiple different scenarios when you're out there in clinicals and when you're out there working as a phlebotomist. And this is a very important part, and you want to be a very thorough phlebotomist and a very professional phlebotomist. You want to take your job seriously as it is and make sure that you're doing it correctly so always make sure that you read the manufacturer's directions you get the proper training on the policies and procedures set forth at your facility to make sure you're following them to a t right because you could come into situations where you don't you're drawing with a butterfly and if so then we don't want to draw the anaerobic bottle first right and then what if you don't get enough blood in your syringe and the vein collapses then you need to put all that blood into the aerobic bottle. Know the policy and procedures at your facility. Ask questions and make sure you know the way your facility has it dictated out that it's done there. Okay, so blood cultures are typically drawn four different ways, right? You have the SPS tube, which is yellow, right? You have then, and I know y'all have seen this in the lab before, it looks different, it's kind of got that yellow and black stopper on it. It says on the top, isolator tube, but it is a yellow top tube. And remember, if it's drawn for blood cultures, it's drawn first, right? Then you can always use a syringe, and you see down here at the bottom to the left, you see someone drawing blood with a syringe with a syringe needle attached, right? You can draw it that way. And then what you do is you see in that picture to the bottom on the left, you see the two blood culture bottles there, anaerobic and aerobic bottle. What you would do is once you've drawn, and you remember there's things with syringes you need to do first, right? Like breaking the seal, making sure that once, you're, once you've drawn all your blood that you pull back just a little bit so that when you remove, after you've applied the safety device and you remove that needle from the syringe, and it goes directly into the sharps container that you're not dropping blood everywhere, right? So if you pull back a little on the plunger and pull that blood that's in that needle in the barrel, that needle into the syringe, it will cut down on the possibility of dripping blood, right? And we throw it directly up into our sharps container. We apply our transfer device. We turn it over and let that um, bubble rise. And then as our Blood culture bottles are sitting upright on the table. They've been sanitized too. Then we take our gauze off the first one, put it onto there. It draws the right amount in. You take it off, put it onto the second bottle, draw the right amount. And then if you have another tube to draw, then you put that tube onto the transfer device and, let, and pull in the amount of blood needed into each individual tube, okay? Then also there's a butterfly, okay? And then you have your, your butterfly, and then just like the picture shows on the bottom uh, right-hand side, you can attach your butterfly directly to your, your, your holder and then draw it in the bottles. But remember, we, if, if the bottle that's anaerobic, we don't want air in there, so you would not draw it first with that wing infusion set. Any other time, it would be the one you would feel first, right? So those are the ways. So we have four 
draw four different ways, right? The SPS, the isolator, the syringe, and the butterfly, okay? There's three features of that isolator tube that you guys need to know. First and foremost, it has a lysing agent inside of it. It has reagents that inactivate HIV, and it has contaminant adapters to prevent aerosol, okay? So as you can see, these are usually um, used when drawing blood cultures from an HIV positive patient, okay? That has other underlying issues, right? Like they have something that's causing septicemia. And so now we have to draw blood cultures. And so this isolator tube helps with this, okay? So for any blood collection procedure, that act, actual venipuncture site must not be repalpitated. So what that's just saying to you guys is that at most of the time, the most important thing, right, is aseptic technique. So what we would like to do is that once we've cleaned that with our alcohol acetone scrub pad, once we've cleaned it with the iodine and we've re-wiped that, uh, once the iodine has done its job and dried and we wipe off as much as we can with our isopropyl alcohol and we allow that to dry, we usually don't go back and repalpitate that site, okay? Even if the glove finger is cleaned because aseptic technique is so important. Make sure that when you're originally palpitating for that vein, right, before you clean it, I tell you guys all the time, visualize, visualize exactly where on that arm you're going to penetrate that area with your needle. You need to make a mental note of the vein location and its position in relation to a mole, a crease, a freckle, anything that you can use to help you be able to locate that vein when you go back without touching it again, okay? So here's all the way our thinking slides, right? These are the way that we take all the things that we learn in lab and lecture and put them together to see if you guys are able to handle these situations that you may encounter either in clinicals or working as a phlebotomist. So pause this now, read over it, and see if you're getting the right answers. Okay, now let's talk about glucose tolerance test, GTT, right? And we've talked about this in lab as well. So for a patient who's has symptoms uh, suggesting problems in carbohydrates or sugar metabolism, such as diabetes mellitus, right? The glucose tolerance test can be an effective diagnostic tool, right? Physicians also now use the hemoglobin A1C test to diagnose diabetes. It's like we talked about in lab, guys. There was a time where the GTT test was really the gold standard for diagnosing diabetes mellitus. And we know what happens with people with diabetes mellitus is they are now, for whatever reason, insulin resistant, right? They are unable to break down their sugar and get it out of the bloodstream into our tissue cells, right? So then the blood glucose levels build up and, um, we diagnose our patients with diabetes mellitus. Nowadays, the gold standard is the hemoglobin A1C test. You know, I talked to you all about the tattletale test, right? That's usually now what we use to diagnose diabetes. Having said that, you will come into a lot of situations where you're doing these GTT tests on women suspected of having gestational diabetes or trying to rule out that she may have gestational diabetes. She may have a family history of diabetes. Um, she may have other signs or symptoms that's leading her doctor to want to double check and make sure that she is not developing or has not developed gestational diabetes. So prior to the GTT test, these are the things that you wanna to talk to your patient on. And phlebotomists do this a lot. You guys may be talking to these patients about what they need to do before they come back in to have the glucose tolerance test done. And make sure that over the next several days, they eat normal meals, right? Then they should fast 8 to 12 hours before coming in for the test the day before, right? And we still do not want them to drink unsweetened tea or coffee or any other beverage other than water, right? We want them to stay hydrated, but only with water. And we want to make sure we tell them to drink plenty of water so they will be hydrated, right? Also, you let them know. 
the night before and leading up to they coming to, ha to have that test, they do not need to smoke, chew tobacco, or even chew gum. We don't want them to exercise that morning. And we don't want them to have this test done if they've had an illness within the last two weeks. So we went over this procedure in lab and we're going to talk about it right, right now, right? So first thing that happens, you know, we, we, give, we give those that patient those instructions. They come in for their uh, GTT test. And the first thing we're going to do is introduce ourselves, ID our patient. And then during our medical interview, we're going to make sure that they follow the guidelines that we laid out for them, that they have not eaten anything or smoked or drank coffee or anything like that first, right? So if that's all good, then the first thing we're going to do is obtain a fasting blood glucose specimen. Now, we went over the guidelines for this in lab, and it has to fall into a normal range, right? So if those fasting blood glucose that fasting blood glucose level on that patient comes back normal, then we can move forward with the test. If it comes back abnormal, then we must notify our physician and then he will guide us on whether we should continue with the, um, with the test or not. Guys, I can't tell you how vitally important it is for you to wait before you ever start the glucose tolerance test until you get your fasting blood specimen results back and someone lets you know that they are normal and it's good to go. Never ever give your patient glucose if their, their fasting blood sugar level is high, okay? You could kill them, okay? So now what we do is we get that fasting blood specimen result back. It's normal, so now we can move forward with the test, right? So then what we're going to do is we're going to give them, and it's usually a 75 milligram and you'll see there's a picture there's a 50 milligram um 50 grams um 75 grams 100 grams of sugar in each one of these different solutions right so what you do is you get the patient to drink that standard dose of of glucola okay which is 75 grams if the results are abnormal the physician should be notified right samples are taken at the half hour after they drink it, right? We talked about this in lab. So what we do is this is with an adult, right? So we give them that standard dose of glucola. Now, the minute we give them the drink and they start drinking it, we want to write down the time they started drinking it. They need to get that, that glucola drank within five minutes, okay? So we note the time they started and then we note the time they finished drinking the glucola, okay? And like I said, they need to drink the whole bottle of glucola within five minutes. So once they've done that, okay, then you start the clock from that time. And 30 minutes later, half an hour later, you draw a sample. Then an hour later, two hours later, and three hours later after the glucola is finished, okay? If the patient is normal, glucose levels should return to normal within two hours after ingesting the glucose. Okay, so we get a fasting sample, it comes back normal, right? We wait to get that first. Then we give them the standard dose of glucola. We, we, when she starts drinking it, we start recording that time. She has to drink it within five minutes and she has to keep it down for a full 30 minutes. So as you're with her, then you wanna note the time she started it, stops drinking it, she finished it. 30 minutes later, okay, after that, we draw our first sample and she has to hold it down too, guys. Remember that. She cannot vomit that stuff up. If she does, then we have to notify our physician and we'll have to do the test again another day. Now, if you do not have diabetes mellitus and everything's normal with your metabolism of sugar, then after two hours after you drink that glucola, your glucose level should be back to normal, okay? And remember, like I talked about, a standard dose of glucose is 75 grams for an adult and one gram per kilogram of body weight for children. We talked about this in lab. One pound is approximately equal to, not exact, but approximately equal to half a kilogram. A dose of 50 to 75 grams is recommended for gestational diabetes. The patient must start and finish the drink within five minutes. The time the patient finishes the glucola is noted. Water intake is encouraged throughout the procedure. And remember, like I said, if the patient vomits, 
the physician must be notified to see if the procedure should be stopped. The tube should be labeled with the basic six as well as 30 minutes, 60 minutes, right, etc. the samples that were drawn. The times are always calculated from when the patient finished drinking the glucola, right? That starts it, right? That first half hour specimen is from the time they finished drinking the glucola. Each specimen should be sent to the lab immediately. Venous blood is preferred specimen because normals are determined from venous blood. SST or a gray top tube should be used and we know that the gray top tube really is the best tube because it has sodium fluoride in it, which is a preservative that preserves our glucose, right? We need to understand things, medications that interfere with GTT, alcohol, either on the skin or if they've been drinking large amounts of alcohol, anticonvulsants, blood pressure medicines, right? All these things listed on here, salicylates in high doses, okay? So make sure that you do that medical interview and make note of any medications they're on that could cause a problem with this test. Okay, so certain physical conditions that can affect the GTT and must be reported to the doctor, okay? Acute pancreatitis, adrenal insufficiencies. They already have been diagnosed with diabetes mellitus, which I would think their physician would already know these things, right? But you want to make sure that you are aware that any of these things could affect that GTT. And if the patient tells you they have any of these things, you always want to go ahead and note them just so you're, in case your physician doesn't know, he will have them listed on here. But make sure you're aware, guys, any of this stuff from, like I said, acute pancreatitis all the way down to pregnancy and stress. Which if you're doing this to diagnose gestational diabetes, we know the patient is probably been ordered by their OB and they, everybody knows they're pregnant, right? So here's one of our thinking slides, right? I really want you guys to get good at analyzing these situations, right? Because this is the way you know that the stuff that you're learning in both lab and lecture are preparing you to be a really good phlebotomist, whether in your clinical setting or when you're out working, right? So you have a GTT ordered on a seven-year-old child, which could happen, right? The child weighs 50 pounds. How much glucola solution should be given to that child? Remember, I told you that it has, you have to first convert pounds into kilograms. I showed you how to do that. I talked about that, right? And then how much per one kilogram, right? So pause this now and see if you're remembering this and you're getting it down and know how to do these conversions. Because remember, half, right? I said half. So half of 50 is 25, right? And one pound equals, so then you have one, one gram per kilogram. So then you would give them 25 grams of glucola. Pause this one now and make sure you're getting the answer. So we can see that it started from eight, right? That's when they stopped drinking the glucola. So 30 minutes later is 8.30, right? Well, another 30 minutes later is an hour. So then that gets you at the nine, right? And then you got to do two hours from that, okay? And then three hours from that. So make sure you understand this, okay? Okay, now let's move on to talking about the postprandial glucose test, okay? The two-hour postprandial glucose test is used to screen patients for diabetes because specimens drawn at two hours after a, after a meal are rarely elevated in normal patients, okay? So this can be a test where we can screen patients uh, to see if they're diabetic, okay? Remember, postprandial means after a meal, okay? So this is checking your glucose levels two, after, two hours after you've consumed a meal. And we, we know from earlier when we talked about that if, you're, if you do not have diabetes and, and your, your um, metabolism of carbohydrates and glucose is normal, 
then most people can eat and their glucose levels are going to go back to normal within two hours of having that meal, right? So the day of the test, the patient should eat a breakfast, the equivalent of 75 to 100 grams of glucose, okay? A blood specimen is taken two hours after that meal is consumed. All right, so now let's talk about the oral glucose tolerance test, okay? And what we refer to as the modified oral glucose tolerance test, after a fasting specimen is collected, the patient is given 75 grams of glucola and another specimen is collected two hours later. So you can see where this is a lot like our glucose tolerance test, right? But it's modified in the sense that I don't have to stick the patient that many times, right? What I can do is have them come in for their test fasting, right? And then I draw that fasting specimen. I make sure it's normal. If it is normal, then I give them the 75 grams of glucola to have within five minutes to drink it. I want to note the start time, the end time. I start my clock from the time they finish drinking the glucola. Then two hours later, I draw another specimen. If they don't have anything wrong with them, then their glucose will be normal, okay? If they do have an issue with glucose metabolism, diabetes or something else, then their two-hour uh, specimen will be elevated. Okay, so now let's talk about a hemoglobin A1C test, right? Glycylated hemoglobin, right? Which means sugar-coated hemoglobin. This occurs when a diabetic patient's diet is out of control, right? The hemoglobin A1C stays high for 120 days or the lifespan of that RBC. So we can see what's going on with that patient over a longer period of time, okay? Like 120 days. And we talked about this in lab as well. We talked about how we sometimes can refer to the hemoglobin A1C test as a tattletale test. Lactose tolerance test. So some people have difficulty digesting lactose, right? Which is a milk sugar. It's the sugar found in milk. They lack the enzyme lactase. Remember, that's how we know it's an enzyme ace, right? From medical terminology. That's why medical terminology is so important. It helps us, okay? So that they don't have that lactase enzyme. That enzyme is the enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is the milk sugar, right? It breaks it down from lactose into glucose and galactose. So they have gastrointestinal discomfort followed by diarrhea after drinking a milk product. The preferred method, and you'll see it in that lower picture to your right, is the, uh, is the method of breath hydrogen. Exhaled gases are analyzed for hydrogen, a byproduct of bacteria that breaks down lactose. So we're still talking about lactose uh, tolerance test, right? So a procedure that is becoming less preferred is the lactose tolerance test. That's where a solution containing 50 grams of lactose is given to the patient, right? Then we have a collection of a baseline specimen is collected, then 5, 10, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minute specimens later are collected and tested for glucose. As you can see, that's a lot of drawing blood. Okay, so that's why really they're going more to that method you see down there on the bottom, that breath test, right? If the patient is normal, the glucose will be similar to the GTT. If they lack lactase, the glucose level will increase by no more than 20 milligrams per deciliter from the fasting sample. Okay, we have other tolerance tests that are performed out there. So the epinephrine tolerance test, okay? Guys, you need to get these tolerance tests down, okay? So this test, particular test, uses epinephrine to break down glycogen into glucose. What this test is doing is test for the availability of glycogen. So the first thing we do is take a fasting glucose sample, okay? And then epinephrine is injected 30 minutes later, okay? And then two hours later, we do a glucose specimen, which should be at the fasting level if the patient is normal, okay? So remember, it's the epinephrine test, 
okay, is testing for the availability of glycogen. And remember, that's your stored glucose. Glucose, insulin comes into the bloodstream. It takes the excess, excess glucose that is flowing through your veins, and it moves it into our liver and our muscles and stores it as glycogen, right, for us to use later when we need it, okay? For us to test to see about the availability for glycogen, we can use this epinephrine test where we, you know, um, we, we check, check their glu fasting glucose level, and then we inject them with that epinephrine 30 minutes later, and then we take a glu two hour glucose specimen from them. And at fasting level, if normal, okay, it should be at their fasting level. Then we have the glucagon tolerance test. It uses glucagon to break down glycogen into glucose. This is another test that tests for the availability of glycogen, okay? Same thing, we have that fasting glucose taken, and then glucagon is injected 30 minutes later instead of epinephrine, right? And then again, two hours later, we get another glucose sample, and if it's the same at fasting level, then the patient is normal. Here is one of our situations that we want to analyze and think through and see if we're putting together everything we're learning and getting the question right. So you guys pause this one now, read through it, and before you start back up, to the answer, make sure you're getting the right answer in your understanding. And remember, you can always reach out to me, okay? Call me, text me, email me, or talk to me about it in lab. Make notes if there's anything that's not clicking for you. Okay. So still talking about other types of tolerance tests. We have the DXLOS tolerance test. Now this test tests for malabsorption, okay? DXLOS is a sugar in certain fruits, not normally in urine or blood, okay? So a special diet limiting DXLOS three days prior to the test, right? So you have to get on that special diet, okay? And then you come in, for your test, you're injected with 25 grams of dexlose, and then we take both blood and urine specimen and analyze them for dexlose at two hours and five hours, okay? So just remember, this is a test for malabsorption, okay? And we put them on a special diet limiting any dexlose in their diet, which is found in certain fruits, right? Then when they come back in three days later, right, we collect both blood and urine from them and we analyze it for that DXLOS at two hours and five hours, okay? And remember, we do inject them with that 25 grams of DXLOS, okay? Okay, for the five tolerance test, you wanna be able to tell what substance is administered, its action, or what acts on it and what substance is measured. You know this is going to be on a test, right? So just look at this, use this as a way to study, okay? You got your GTT, glucose tolerance test. What do we administer? Glucose, remember, in our little glucola. What action are we looking for? Whether insulin will break down our glucose, right? What are we measuring? We're measuring glucose, okay? We have our epinephrine tolerance test. What's being administered? Epinephrine. What are we looking for? What action should take place? That epinephrine breaks down glycogen into glucose. So if we don't have the availability of glycogen, then we, the epinephrine won't have anything to break down into glucose. So then when we go to measure our glucose, it won't be what we're looking for. Does that make sense to you guys? If you're having any issue with it, please get with me, okay? Then we have the glucagon tolerance test, okay? What do we give the person? What do we administer them? Glucagon, right? What we're looking for is the same thing in the epinephrine test, except what is administered is different. We're looking to administer them with glucagon, which should break down glycogen into glucose. And then we test to see what the glucose level is. That's what's measured, right? 
but we're trying to see about the availability of our glycogen in both our epinephrine and our glucagon, glucagon tolerance tests. Make sure you're getting this stuff down, guys. Then we have lactose tolerance test. What do we give the patient? Lactose, right? We want to see if they have the enzyme lactase because lactase breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Then we want to measure their glucose levels, okay? Because if the glucose level is not what it's supposed to be, then that could mean that they're missing that lactase enzyme because it wasn't there to break down that lactose, which is a milk sugar, into glucose and galactose, okay? Then we have dexlose. Remember, dexlose is found in certain fruit, okay? So what we do is we put them on that special diet for about three days where they're not having any of that types of fruit. They come in, we administer dexlose to them, okay? We see if it's absorbed, and then we measure for it to see if they're able to absorb it or not. Pause this, read through the situation, and see if you're able to answer it correctly. Okay, now we're gonna go on and talk about arterial blood gases, right? The arterial blood gases, commonly known as ABGs, right? It's a test that provides information about the respiratory status of a patient, right? We're talking about that oxygen and carbon dioxide, and we're talking about the acid base or pH balance of our patients. And we're usually talking about patients with pulmonary disease or other injuries or other diseases that can also be associated or not associated, the other diseases such as diabetes mellitus, right? Okay, so the three tests performed on an ABG specimen are the pH, like we talked about above, right? The PO2 and the PCO2, okay? Arterial blood is used rather than venous blood because arterial blood has the same composition throughout the body, okay? Okay, guys, let's move on and talk about the puncture site for ABGs. So the radial artery, which is located on the thumb side of the wrist, and remember, you're looking for that radial artery when you are, it's on the thumb side of the wrist, right? And that's the artery most frequently used for the ABG analysis. This artery has what they refer to as collateral flow. What does that mean? That means two different arteries, both the radial and the ulnar arteries, supply blood to that hand, okay? The radial artery lies over ligaments and bones of the wrist and can be easily compressed to lessen the chance of a hematoma. Okay, the drawback to using the radial artery is its small size. Okay, but the plus of using the radial artery is that it's easily compressed. But also you need to remember that this artery is chosen and used most often because it has what they refer to as collateral flow. And remember guys, with collateral flow, if something were to go wrong with that one artery, the, the radial artery, you would still have an artery that could get blood flow to that hand, okay? But we always want to never do any damage to veins or arteries, right? Because these are the things that take blood to our tissues, drop off oxygen, keep it oxygenated with nutrients and other things and pick up waste and carbon dioxide and bring it back, right? So we want to make sure that hand or wherever we're drawing is still able to get oxygen and nutrients to it. So remember about that collateral flow. And the Allen test is the test that we use to double check to make sure that we're getting that both the radial and the ulnar artery are supplying blood to that hand, that Allen test. And we'll talk about that in lab. Okay, so the brachial artery is an alternative site for the ABG. It is located in the antecubital fossa on the body side of the upper arm, okay? So study tip here is body side and brachial. Both start with a B. That will help you, okay? But remember, radial artery in the wrist, okay? On the thumb side, brachial artery, okay? 
body, right? Upper arm and a cubital fossa, arm, upper arm, right? Another choice is the femoral artery. It is the largest artery used in ABG collection. It's located in the groin area of the leg, lateral to the femur bone. Even though the brachial and femoral, femoral arteries are larger than the radial artery, they are used less frequency, frequently because they lack what we talked about with that collateral circulation, okay? The femoral artery is sometimes used on patients with cardiovascular disorders or when there is a low cardiac output. Like if you have somebody in the ER that's had a gunshot and they're bleeding heavily, um, heart failure, uh, myocardial infarctions, things like this, okay? But remember, that collateral circulation, or collateral flow is very important because we don't want to do anything that's going to damage those arteries. And with that hand, they have two separate arteries that's, that's feeding that hand, right? So make sure you understand about that collateral circulation and why we would rather not use that brachial or femoral artery if we can get away with it, okay? And remember, femur, femoral, right? Okay? So usually the femoral artery is the last choice because of the possibility of releasing plaque, right, from the inner wall of the artery, especially for geriatric, geriatric patients. And there is a chance of infection since it is near the pubic hair area, right? You, have, you can have more just surface germs there and you don't want those to get into that artery and then cause any type of infection. The femoral artery is entered at a 90 degree angle, okay? Care must be taken when using the brachial artery for the ABG test because the basilic vein or the median vein may be punctured by accident. And then you're not getting arterial blood, even though you think you are, you're getting venous blood, which is a completely different makeup, right? And we don't want to give out erroneous results. So, now we talked earlier about this uh, Allen test, right? So to use the radial artery, the healthcare provider must first perform what we now refer to as the modified Allen test to make sure the ulnar and radial arteries are providing that collateral circulation, right? So the Allen test compresses both arteries and you see that picture A in your top left-hand corner, okay? So you take those fingers, and you press down on both of those arteries to compress them, right? And you ask your patient to make a fist. Then, as you're still holding that pressure, you ask the patient to open his or her fist and pressure is released on the ulnar artery only. So if you notice these pictures, guys, we're, we're compressing both arteries, both the, uh, both the radial and the ulnar artery, have them make a fist, and we see in picture B in the middle, we get them to open their fist, and that white area is because, you know, when you cut off circulation to something, it starts losing that nice pink color, right? That nice pink, nice pinkish reddish color lets us know that our blood, that I, that area of our body is being supplied with oxygen, right? Well, we've cut off the oxygen to that hand. That's why you have that whitish area there, okay? So then what you do is like I said, you release pressure on the ulnar artery only. And we see we release pressure in photo C, the one to the far right, on the hand on the side that is away from the thumb. Because remember, the radial artery is on the thumb side. So we let go of the ulnar. And now how we see the white spots gone away, that tells us that uh, that ulnar artery is supplying blood to that hand, okay? All right? And, and, and the blood should start filling back up in that hand within five to 10 seconds. And then that tells you if within five to 10 seconds, okay, that hand fills up, that's a positive Allen test, which means the ulnar artery is supplying blood to that hand, so you can stick that radial artery. Now, a negative test indicates that either the, the inability of that ulnar artery to supply blood to the hand either it supplies some, but not a lot. It's, it's insufficient or it's not working at all. If that's the case, you're getting a negative Allen test. You're going to have to talk to your physician or you're going to have to do your policy and procedures for what you do next, okay? So now, 
I want you guys at home uh, to, to answer these questions, right? So let's take these one at a time. I want you to pause them. Do you let up pressure on both arteries? Pause it, see if you're answering it right. No, right? We only let up pressure off the ulnar side, which is the side that is not on the same side as the thumb, right? Okay, we cannot practice this Allen test on your lab partner, but find someone in your house or a neighbor or a friend, uh, your significant other, your child, someone that you can practice the Allen test on. Okay, so do that and, and it's real interesting to see how that works. So you guys try that out at home and we'll also try it in lab. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, the radial, which we know that's the, the, the place of choice, ABG procedure, right? So, first of all, the patient must be stable, okay? No respiratory changes, okay, for 30 minutes prior to the ABG test. Of course, that's for just regular patients. You may have times when you have to draw ABGs on patients that are not stable if the doctor orders it, right? But this is what you would prefer. You would prefer the patient to be calm and... Um, because anxiety can lead to hyperventilation, which will alter your ABG result. And they're not accurate, right? Because they're really just altered because they're anxious and they're starting to hyperventilate, not because they have some pulmonary or heart or lung issue, right? So before proceeding, determine if the patient is on anticoagulant therapy, right? If allergic to lidocaine, the patient's temperature, the oxygen concentration from the respirator, and the respiration rate, okay? Arterial blood results from some analytes vary from venous blood. Therefore, arterial blood should be collected for the ABG test only. Okay, let's look at some of the complications associated with ABGs. You can lacerate that artery. You can have spasms of the artery. You can have a hematoma, a thrombosis, or an infection. These are the things that we want to avoid. And the way we avoid these things is making sure that we perform each one of the steps in this procedure correctly and in the correct order and we perform all procedures. So the wrist should be slightly extended and rotated. Perform the Allen test first, right? Then you want to clean the area with iodine. The area can be anesthetized with lidocaine if desired by the patient and they are not allergic to it. And you'll see the pictures over here. We have the picture at the top where you get the wrist ready, right? A lot of times you can roll up a little washcloth or something to put onto the back side of that wrist. And you'll see them doing that in that uh, demonstration. And we'll go over this in lab as well. Now, once you perform the Allen test, you have a positive Allen test and you know both the, you know that owner is supplying sufficient blood supply to the hand, then you can move forward with cleaning your patient and anesthetizing your patient if, if need be. No tourniquet is necessary, okay? Because arterial pressure causes the heparinized one to five milliliter syringe to fill automatically, okay? It's that heartbeat behind it, right? So you feel for it with the heartbeat, and then you can see that angle that you go into. It's a 45 degree angle is used for the radial artery puncture, okay? You're going in at a 45 degree angle and then the syringe plunger will automatically start to go back on its own because of that arterial pressure, okay? You collect approximately one mil of blood. You want to try to avoid all air bubbles, then remove the syringe needle, applying direct pressure for at least five minutes. Mix the blood with the heparin in the syringe, right? Then you want to label it and immediately place it in that ice water slurry. Before leaving, the healthcare worker should clean off the iodine with alcohol and apply a pressure bandage. The primary nurse should be notified so that the area may be checked frequently for bleeding. The specimen should be analyzed within 10 minutes of collection and your needle length and gauge used for an ABG is one inch long and it's a 22 gauge needle. A butterfly needle is never used to draw an ABG because of the air in the tubing. 
Okay, so now let's move on and talk about therapeutic drug monitoring, TDM. Therapeutic drug monitoring is used to monitor the serum concentrations of certain drugs. It's used if the drug is highly toxic, right? We want to monitor make sure they're getting enough for that drug to be effective, but not too much where it can cause damage or death to our patient, right? These drugs that we know that can be highly toxic, we want to make sure we monitor those drugs. If underdosing or even overdosing can have serious consequences, we want to monitor those drugs. We want to monitor, make sure we're not having any types of drug reactions. We want to see if patients are metabolizing the drug because patients can metabolize drugs at different rates depending on different other different issues they may have. So we always want to check to make sure that before we give them their next dose of drug, they don't have too much of that drug in their body already due to the fact that they weren't able to break it down, right? Therapeutic drug monitoring is often used for patients taking things like anticonvulsant drugs, um, like digitoxin, lithium, all kinds of stuff. I'm not gonna read each one of these out to you, and a lot of times we use it for antibiotics like gentamicin or vancomycin, okay? Because these are antibiotics that we wanna make sure they're getting enough to do their job, but they can be toxic at certain levels. So we wanna monitor that. And you'll see that picture down at the bottom talking about troughs. That's that area down there where it's real low, right? That's the lowest level of the drug. And we see the peak. Well guys, just keep in mind the peak is they giving you your medication through the IV, right? It's coursing through your veins, right? That's going to be the peak level of that medication. Then after hours and you've taken this medicine, okay, and it's doing its job, but your body is starting to break it down, right? It's working, but your body's breaking it down and getting rid of it. At the lowest level, after you've had this medication in your system for a certain amount of time, that would be the trough, okay? And we always want to check our peaks at a certain level to make sure they got their medicine and they got the right dose of medicine. And then before we give them their next dose, we want to check their trough to make sure that it's low enough for us to feel safe in giving them their next dose. And I'm going to go over that again because these troughs and peaks give people a lot of trouble, okay? So we want to be able to evaluate the dosage level of drugs, right? many of them. The collections of trough and peak levels are necessary, right? Again, like I said, the trough level is that lowest concentration in the patient serum. It's usually drawn right before you give them their next dose of drugs, right? Because we wouldn't want to give them their next dose of medication if they hadn't metabolized and broke down enough of that drug because we wouldn't want it to build up and become toxic or cause damage, right? So uh, that's, that's the trough, and that's the importance of the trough. The peak level is the highest concentration in the patient serum. It varies with the mode of administration, right? You have intramuscular, where they give you a shot, like in your behind or your arm, right? Versus a vein. Obviously, if you're getting that medication directly into your vein, it goes directly into your bloodstream, right? the peak level would be quicker, right? It would go up faster. And the time that you draw your peak is going to be based on whether they gave that medicine by IV or whether they gave it by IM, okay? So it's important to remember that because you would know that if you injected it into the muscle, it's going to take a little bit longer for that medication to get into your bloodstream. But if you give it directly in your bloodstream, it's going to be there quicker, right? So that would determine the time in which we drew our peak level right? And then you have what they refer to as a random level, right? For certain drugs administered by continuous uh, infusion after enough time has elapsed for the drug to reach equilibrium, okay? So what you do is you just, if they're giving them a, a drug, once they give them the drug, then the nurse and doctor will determine when will be the best elapsed time to go ahead. They should be at equilibrium by then, but we want to draw a level and make sure that the time they're working out in their mind is working out for that patient, okay? So several drugs cannot be drawn in SST tubes, 
okay, because falsely low levels of some drugs have occurred. SHT tubes should be avoided for TDMs unless evaluated and determined not to interfere. Always follow the policies and procedures for your facility and for any reference labs that you're sending medications out to. Make sure you're drawing your specimens in the tube that they have requested. Okay, time of collection is more critical for drugs with shorter half-lives, such as genomycin, tobramycin, um, and others, right? Those types of drugs have longer half-lives, um, uh, have shorter half-lives, and then you have stuff like phenobarbital and digoxin, which um, have longer half-lives. And when we're talking about half-life, we're talking about how long does it take for your body to break it down? Like if the level was 10, how long does it take your body to get the level of that drug to five, right? We want to make sure that your liver, your kidneys, all your bodily functions are working in a way that, that not only can that medicine get into your bloodstream and do its job, but your body is able to break it down and remove it from your system so it doesn't build up in your system and become toxic. So certain drug levels can be altered if drawn through a CVC, a central venous catheter, right? Blood for TDM should not be taken from the arm into which a continuous IV or other fluids are infused. Okay, now let's talk about trace metals. So testing for trace metals should be performed in specifically prepared trace metal free evacuated tubes. For lead determinations, we have a TAN lead-free, heparinized, evacuated tube, and that's the tube that should be used for lead. The royal blue tubes are available for trace elements. So make sure you understand that that tan tube is a lead-free, heparinized tube, and it's used for lead determinations, and our royal blue top tubes are available for trace elements. The genetic molecular test, we're going to move on to talking about that, requires an informed consent from the patient prior to collection. We collect it in a lavender or purple top tube, or your facility or reference lab may have specially designed collection tubes. You want to follow whatever your policies and procedures are for both your facility and any reference lab they're contracted with, right? For cytogenetic testing, a green top tube is used and the patient's correct demographics, age, place of birth, patient's race, etc., must be obtained. Again, they should have certain forms and policies and procedures associated with this, and depending on your facility or reference lab, you want to follow their guidelines. Genetic material is only viable for 6 to 24 hours, should, so it should be sent to that lab or reference lab immediately. Let's talk about IV line collections. Intravenous, intravenous lines are used to administer medications. They use them to administer blood transfusion and other fluids because the substances enter directly into the bloodstream and the outcomes are more rapid than for oral medication, right? You can see that if you want a medicine to get in there and quickly, then it would be best to give it into the directly into the vein, right? Drawing blood through IV or central venous catheters requires special techniques, training, and experience. A CVC, also called a central intravenous line, is one of the numerous vascular as access devices, right? The CVC is usually inserted into either the subclavian vein in the chest below the clavicle, the jugular vein, or the superior vena cava. A dressing covers the CVC tubing that extends below the skin. You see some pictures over here to your right. And there's a lot of great diagrams and pictures in your textbook. Another VAD is a peripherally inserted central catheter, which is PIC, right? Which is inserted into the cephalicobacillic vein of the hand. A PIC is usually only used for blood collection when it is first inserted because it can become easily infected around the area. The IV line is a direct pathway into the patient's bloodstream. So every time the IV system is entered, 
the possibility of a serious nosocomial infection exists. Some facilities do not allow evacuated blood tubes to be used for blood collection because of the buildup of pressure in the catheter. Heparin is used to flush the line and can bind within the catheter and lead to inaccurate coagulation tests. Okay, so you will notice that they may use these lines when they get them in and to draw that first set of blood and it's usually done by a nurse. After that, these are typically never used for blood collection. Again, you will follow the policy and procedures of your facility and do what is expected of you in this situation. But I want you to know these things exist. That's why a septic technique, when you're dealing with patients and being able to break that cycle of infection, right? We don't want to complete that chain of infection. So we always want to make sure anytime we're collecting from a line or a patient's arm, cleansing that area and allowing that alcohol or betadine or iodine to do its job is vitally important to cut down on nosocomial infections. And we're still talking about that CVC, right? So this is the procedures, right? For the CVC blood collection procedure. You want to check your patient's chart for physician's orders to collect blood through the CVC or speak to their nurse. You would never want to draw blood from a CVC if it has been noted on their chart that blood is to not be drawn from there, okay? So you need to get approval for this before you do it because specific training, okay, needs to be done. Aseptic, aseptically draw up to, and again, aseptic technique, right? You want to draw up 10 milliliters of injectable normal saline into a syringe. You want to position the patient with the catheter hook at or below the level of the patient's heart. You shut off the IV fluids for at least two minutes, if authorized to do so, and unclamp the most proximal lumen of the catheter. You swab that hub, right, with antimicrobial wipes for 30 seconds and then allow them to dry. You insert that 20 ml saline filled needleless syringe into the cap and unclamp the catheter. You then flush the catheter with five to 10 mils of that saline to determine patency or lack of obstruction, okay? Then you clamp the catheter, remove the syringe and insert new needleless 10 ml empty syringe and unclamp the catheter. You want to aspirate slowly and steadily, bring back five ml of blood to discard, or eight to 10 ml if coagulation studies are ordered. You remove that syringe with the blood and it's disposed of properly. You swab the cap again with an antimicrobial swab, wait for it to dry and do its job, then you insert a new 10 ml syringe and aspirate whatever the required amount of blood is that you need for your test. Then you will transfer the blood from the syringe to the appropriate vacuum container tubes using a transfer device and putting that blood into the tubes in the appropriate order of draw with the appropriate amount of blood in each tube. Okay? You irrigate the catheter with a second needleless syringe containing 10 ml of saline, clamp the catheter, and remove the syringe. Determine that IV fluids are infusing properly. Document that the blood was drawn by a line draw. So cannulas and fistulas, okay? A cannula is a tubular instrument used to access venous blood for dialysis and blood collection by again, specially trained healthcare workers. It is surgically implanted in the arm of a dialysis patient for dialysis. Study hint, you can draw blood through a can, cannula, right? A fistula is an artificial shunt in which a vein and artery have been fused through surgery for use in dialysis. A fistula is never used for blood collection. We would not want to mess that up and then them not be able to get their dialysis. But it is, but if it is, and, and guys, phlebotomists almost, unless they have extensive training and you would have to have approval, okay? 
Only those specialized personnel can collect that blood. If it becomes infected, surgery is required to form a new one. We would never ever want to do anything to mess up their dialysis, their fistula. And we, we would never draw blood out of this unless we were specialized, trained, authorized personnel to do so, right? A tourniquet cannot be used on the arm with a fistula, okay? You would never put a tourniquet on the arm of a patient with a fistula. Remember, it will hit you with its fist if you try to draw blood through it, okay? Don't do it. So let's talk about donor room collections, okay? First, a potential donor must be interviewed. A lot of times now that interview is performed over a computer. And then a medical history and a physical exam are performed to see if they should be excluded for any reason. Blood pressure, they check your hemoglobin, things of this nature, right? Only properly trained people are employed in a blood center because a physical, emotional, or traumatic experience may keep a donor from volunteering in the future. And we need people to volunteer for blood donation. Carefully determining donor eligibility not only prevents the spread of disease to blood product recipients, but also prevents hurting a potential donor. To help minimize dizziness and fainting, donors are encouraged to eat within four to six hours of donating blood. Never donate blood on an empty stomach. Physical exam prior to blood donation. Okay, guys, you're going to need to know these things. Weight. Must weigh at least 110 pounds. The temperature must not exceed 37.5 degrees Celsius. Your pulse must be between 50 and 100 beats per minute, taken for at least 15 seconds. The blood pressure should be no higher than 180, and that's your diastolic, and no higher than 100, okay? I mean, your systolic is no higher than 180, and your diastolic is no higher than 100, okay? Skin lesions, so examination of the signs for drug abuse, they're going to look for that, and that would be something that they check for that could, could get you to be rejected as being able to, to uh, donate blood. Your general appearance, they want to examine for illness, nervousness, to make sure that you don't look like you are impaired due to alcohol or drugs. They're going to check your hemoglobin or hematocrit. Your hematocrit must be no less than 38% or hemoglobin no less than 12.5 grams per deciliter. This is usually done by a copper sulfate method. That's that little blue liquid that they stick your finger and drop a drop of blood in it and looking for results from there. An extensive medical history must be taken, usually on a card or nowadays on a computer. An autologous transfusion is where the patient donates his or her own blood before anticipated surgery. So if you knew that you were having surgery six months from now, whatever, you may go in and donate your own blood to have on, on standby for you so that when you're having your surgery, if you need the blood, you can get your own blood, right? It can prevent, or it does prevent, transfusion, transmitted infections, diseases such as HIV and hepatitis B, and eliminates the formation of antibodies in the transfused patient. If you can do it, it's the best way to go. Let's talk about therapeutic phlebotomy. Therapeutic, therapeutic phlebotomy is the intentional removal of blood for therapeutic reasons. It is used for things like polycythemia or other diseases in which there is an extensive production of blood cells. Records in the blood bank should indicate the patient's diagnosis, physician's request, and the amount of blood to be taken. Generally, the patient should be bled more slowly than a healthy donor, and the resting period should be extended. The blood obtained may be used for homologous transfusion if deemed suitable by the blood bank director and the patient's doctor. So guys, that's the end of this chapter, okay? So I've gotten up chapter 13 and 14. This is chapter 15. You will have your listings. Remember, all that stuff is located in your black binder, right? So make sure you're reading these chapters in your textbook. You're watching these PowerPoint presentations and as you're watching them, you have out your review guides. You're filling those out 
and then you study those review guides. This test will be on us before we know it. So remember, we talked about ABGs and capillary blood tests. We talked about bleeding time, blood cultures, the tolerance test, therapeutic drug monitoring, trace metal test, all those collections and things like cannulas, fistulas, IVs, and CVCs. And we talked about briefly about donor room collections. Okay, guys, get to studying. Have a great day.